talk about the German apprenticeship system, Georgia CAT, the Georgia Consortium for Advanced Technical Training. Dr. Steve Humphrey is one of our work-based learning directors, as we call them here at Central Educational Center for the Coweta County School System. That means he works with interns uh, who work with uh, approximately 225 to 250 employers each year in our region. Uh, Steve is going to talk with you a little bit about what we believe is a key prerequisite to having this program start. We're going to let him go first. He's got to get back to work with uh, students and with other teachers. Dr. Steve Humphrey. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit about work-based learning and its ability to provide a base for students to access programs like these. First of all, you need good leadership. We have uh, Mark Whitlock here at CEC. We also have excellent state leadership. And, oh gosh, I just noticed our state program managers out there, Dwayne Hobbs. Um, uh, if you think about work-based learning as a vehicle that can go to different places, and those different places would be uh, West Georgia Technical College, it would be local employers, it would be the development authority, it would be the community. So work-based learning allows those students to interact with all of those different agencies, kind of gives them a passport for them to get into those places and documents to allow them to work with it. So you have to have a strong work-based learning program. You have to have a flexible work-based learning program because the German apprenticeship program is a year-long program, and so the planning never stops for it. The uh, application of the process never stops. And then you have to be available all year long to work with all of your partners. So I would say that's the main thing, just a very uh, robust work-based learning program with flexibility to do what's needed. Do y'all have questions for Steve? He's, he's got to head out, so he's not going to be able to stay with us. Work-based learning, a key prerequisite. Steve, this is kind of work-based learning on steroids, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, now, let's back up and go through introductions. I'm going to ask the panelists first to introduce themselves so they can get used to the microphone. I'm going to ask them to speak directly into the microphone so we can pick them up. We're going to have panelists introduce themselves. Then we're going to go around the room. Uh, should be microphones available. Uh, guys, can you all show us where microphones are that um, some, maybe somebody in the control room? We have microphones available for, for the guests to speak into. Ah, here's a microphone. So if you'll... If you'll pass that around as, as we go through, just pass it to each person, then you can introduce yourself, all right? All right, so let's start here with Stephanie Jelichka. Stephanie, welcome. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, my name is Stephanie Jelichka, very German last name, Jelichka, and I'm the vice president. Usually people laugh at this point. <laughs> all right, thank you. It's Very not that funny. Okay. Um, I'm the vice president of the German American Chamber of Commerce here in the southern United States. We're based in Atlanta, Georgia, and we serve 11 states here in the south, North Carolina, all the way to Texas, and I'll talk about the German apprenticeship model a little later. Yeah, I'm going to stop Stephanie and say, if you want to do a German apprenticeship, you must work with the German American Chamber. The German American Chamber is the legal guardian of these programs around the world. So this is not a program that you have to think up. Stephanie will talk with you about how you can work with the German Chamber to do this. Martin. Yeah, my name is Martin Plyer. I'm the COO of Grenzebach Corporation here in Noonan. Uh, Grenzebach is a family-owned business here in Noonan more than 28 years uh, in Germany since 1960, and we build uh, automation equipment for the glass, building material, and logistic industry. Great, and I'm gonna stop Martin there and tell you that Martin has a background with companies like KUKA Robotics um, in Europe. Martin brings that sense of automation to his work now and to our work at Central Educational Center. He is the chair of the CEC Board of Directors, and Martin, it's because you're the chair of the CEC Board that we're gonna stop right here and tell you and wish you a very happy birthday today. Yay. Thank you. 
21 again. <laughs> yep, second time. <laughs> Kenny, welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kenny Atkins. I'm the apprenticeship specialist or pr apprenticeship coordinator for the Technical College System of Georgia. It is a position that was created uh, just this year because the Technical College System of Georgia thought so much about this new initiative called apprenticeship training, or at least in the in the South, that uh, that I'm dedicating 100% of my time uh, to that effort now. Kenny, I thought you dedicated 100% of your time to help get this started. <laughs> there was a time when I, I did that too. Great. Thanks for being here. Steve. Hello. My name is Steve Cromer with West Georgia Technical College. I'm a senior director for advanced manufacturing. And um, I've been very involved with this uh, German apprenticeship program uh, ever since I got here back in November of last year. And uh, it's very exciting. Great. Steve, uh, we'll get you to talk later on about your trip to Germany to, to study the German apprenticeship system. Thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Philip Schulz. I'm uh, president and CEO of Fostalpin Automotive Body Parts. Okay. We're an automotive supplier originating in Austria. So we're very familiar with apprenticeship programs. Uh, we started our own version here together with the Barto Cartersville Korea, College and Korea Academy. Uh, two years ago, we're in our third year now. Uh, we're seeking to enlarge it and uh, make it better. Uh, that's why I'm here to learn. Great. We appreciate what you're doing in Barto very much. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Hello. My name is Tommy Breedlove. I'm the HR generalist at Haverhill Becker. We're hi, Stephanie. <laughs> we're a member of the. Um, our company is a member of the GACC as well. Um, manufacturing company out in Conyers. Um, German-owned, family-oriented company. Um, I have my coworker Marcus here with me, who's German as well. So I brought him along because he definitely knows all about the German um, apprenticeship program. I learned about this session from the Rockdale Chamber of Commerce meeting, so um, that's why we're here today. Okay. Yeah, you already heard Marcus, Marcus Lackman with the uh, Hava and Böcker. I'm the sales manager in the American. Um, uh, Haver base here and uh, yeah, like Tommy said, I've been through the German um, apprenticeship program at Haver and I'm curious uh, to see and excited about it. Uh, let's get started over here. I'm Jade Morey. I'm the project manager for the Houston County Development Authority and we just landed a German company, Sandler Nonwoven. So we are here to learn, I'm here to learn and perhaps implement a program in Houston County. Good afternoon, I'm Dwayne Hobbs with the Georgia Department of Education, manager for work-based learning programs and our youth apprenticeship program. Dwayne, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there and uh, just remind folks that when you read the literature about work-based learning in the United States, you'll find two states mentioned most often, Georgia and Wisconsin. Uh, Dwayne and I were talking about that before we started the session and Dwayne assured me that Wisconsin makes a great number two state. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura Ergel. I'm the CTA director for Griffin Spalding County Schools, as well as the director for the new Griffin Region College and Career Academy. Hi, I'm Katie Arrowwood. I'm the CEO of the Griffin Region College and Career Academy. Let's, let's have Andrea. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Andrea Harper, and I'm with, I'm with the Georgia Association of Manufacturers, and we represent about 100 companies who employ about 50% of the state's manufacturing workforce, and there's no bigger issue to our membership than workforce development. So we're here to help understand and um, support all of your efforts. Uh, my name is Scott Ross. I'm the executive director for campus operations for West Georgia Tech. I'm Amanda Fields. I'm the existing industries manager for the Coweta County Development Authority. And the Development Authority, um, among other things they have done to help get this program started, uh, they, they wanted to help us brand it. So the t-shirt that I'm wearing is something that all our apprentices has. Amanda, thank you. And Thanks for the work of the Development Authority on this project. Hi, I'm Lynn Love. I'm with the Noonan Coweta Chamber of Commerce. Lynn's on point to help us take this apprenticeship system into some other industries here in Coweta, and we're excited about that. 
Hi, I'm Tammy Maddox. I'm the Work-Based Learning Youth Apprenticeship Coordinator for Rockdale County Schools. Good afternoon. I'm Dwayne Sproul. I'm the Career Academy Director in Decatur and also the Career Technical Director. Hi, I'm Cheryl Namias, and I'm the International Baccalaureate Coordinator at Decatur High School, and I'm very interested in bringing a German apprenticeship model to our main industry in Decatur, which is culinary. And I have a child who's a sophomore at the high school who's studying this year in Germany for the whole year okay. on the Congress Bundestag Scholarship. So, Hi, I'm Brent Eikhoff, a uh, German teacher and um, education pathway teacher at Decatur High School. I'm Kathy Carlisle. I'm the CEO for Think College and Career Academy in LaGrange, Georgia. Good afternoon. My name's Chris Miller. I'm director of production for Kia Motors. I'm humbled to uh, accept an assignment uh, to step in some very big shoes by the uh, vacated, most recently, by my dear friend and colleague, the uh, gentleman that we all know and love, uh, Randy Jackson. So I'm accepting that challenge, some huge shoes to fill. Uh, look forward to working with everyone here. But we're honored today to uh, represent Think, West Georgia Tech, and Troop County. Good afternoon. My name is Johnny D. Jones. I'm the campus dean for Georgia Piedmont Technical College Newton Campus. Also, I serve on the board for Rockdale Career Academy and Newton County Career Academy. <laughs> I am Jill Oldham. I am the CEO of Rockdale Career Academy in Conyers, Georgia. Ben McCumber. I'm the Program Development Coordinator at Rockdale Career Academy. Hi, uh, Robert Hennessy. I'm with Hennessy Auto in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I lead our technician recruiting efforts. Uh, we've got space for about 220 technicians platform-wide, and this is the most severe uh, crisis we've ever faced in terms of a lack of technical educated uh, and, and competent talent. So the next industry that we're working with is the auto dealers in town. They've, they've asked that we establish a German apprenticeship around auto tech. So uh, hope that you and Lynn Love will make some contact while you're here. Hi, my name is Matthew Lindsay. I'm the career tech coordinator for Hateville Charter Career Academy. Hi, Brittany Wilson, Calhoun City Schools. I serve as chief academic officer, and I'm very excited to learn more about Georgia Cat. I thank, thank Mark for piloting that. <laughs> <laughs> Brittany, before you leave today, I hope you'll uh, talk with uh, Dr. Redekop about uh, what you shared with the State Board of Education the other day about <clears throat> Title I. Yeah, thank you. My name is Rod Edge. I'm the Work-Based Learning Coordinator for Floyd County Schools at the College and Career Academy in Floyd County. Hi, my name is Troy Payne. I work for Delta Airlines. and. Uh, in the near future, we have some technical needs coming coming at us, and uh, I talked to Mark, and he invited me in to see if uh, there's some synergy between what you guys have going and our future needs. Troy, thank you for being here to represent Delta. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. I'm David Yarber from uh, Southeastern Technical College. Excuse me, my voice is going away. Um, uh, that's in Vidalia, Georgia, for, for those of you that have never been south of Macon, so uh, uh, that's, that's where we're from, but uh, I'm really interested in this. Our business and industries are also. Shelly Smith, CEO, Southeastern Early College and Career Academy in Vidalia. Hi, I'm Therese Redekop, I'm the Coweta County School System Director of Instruction and CTAE Director. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pike. I'm, I'm an administrator at Think College and Career Academy in Troop County. Hello, I'm Carrie Burkage, and I'm the Workforce Development Manager at Think College and Career Academy and the Work-Based Learning Coordinator. Hi, I'm Penny Johnson. I'm the Director of Secondary Education and oversee CTAE in the Troop County School System. Hi, I'm Mark Peavy with the Technical College System of Georgia. I'm the Executive Director for all of our secondary facing initiatives. Hi, I'm Irene Munn. I work for Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. Hi, my name is Peyton Reisinger, and I, too, work with uh, Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. Hi, I'm Donald White. I'm the Science Content Specialist for Coweta County School System and our STEM Program Manager. Kat, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to lead those who just entered the room up to the front so they can have a seat, and, uh, and we'll let them introduce themselves. We welcome you all. We know weather has been a problem today. So appreciate you being here. 
So why don't we start with Lisa? Is yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa DePrima, um, work-based learning transition career partnership specialist for Bartow County Schools. Hi, I'm Tino Shields. I'm the lead teacher at the Bartow College and Career Academy. Good afternoon. I'm Gina Hartzell, Conyers Rockdale Economic Development. Great. Great. So we, we know who's here. We haven't asked you to sign in. Uh, if, you're, if you want questions, information following this, uh, we'll be sure to get you Irene Munn's email uh, <laughs> so that you can email her and uh, we, we can have all the questions collected there. Guys, we appreciate you being here today. Um, let's, let's go ahead and start the, the slides and I think Martin and Stephanie are gonna kick us off. All right. Okay. Who am I looking at for the slides, you? Jake. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to give it to me? I'll be... Okay. You sure? Okay. All right. I'm, I'm the German. I'm in control of technical <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome again. Guten Tag to us Germans. Um, again, my name is Stephanie Jelicka, the German-American Chambers of Commerce. I have more of a bird's eye view, and I give you a little of my elevator speech of who we are. Uh, we're the official representative of industry and trade here in the United States. We have three main offices, Chicago, New York, Atlanta. It's a big country, so we're divided by regions. Um, headquartered in Atlanta, we're in charge of the southeast or south. Um, as I said earlier, North Carolina is my most northern border, Texas my most western. We have an office in Houston, Texas, a branch office as well that's mainly driven by the oil and gas industry. So our main purpose is to support and help the German industry here in the South. Oh, I also have Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, Steffi, is the, is the German chamber, I mean, is, is this organized differently than other uh, countries' consulates? I mean, you, you represent uh, business interests. That is correct. Um, there are a lot of bilateral chambers around the country and in every um, other country as well. The German system is set up a little differently than most of the chambers you see. You see the French American and the British American and the Swedish American. And on the side or as a separate office, they have a trade commissioner. Uh, Germany is set up where the foreign chambers of commerce are the official representative of industry and trade in the respective country. So we're subsidized by the German Ministry of Economics. There is no trade commissioner. We inherit the role of being the trade commissioner in the respective country we're in. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, maybe, actually the next question always is, why is the German-American Chamber or Chamber of Commerce involved in setting up or in these systems? Well, in Germany, as you can see right here, um, by law, the chamber, the local chamber of commerce, which we have 80 in Germany, 79 actually, um, are the, the competent body to organize, um, examine these students, certify, register. So a lot of German companies, when they come to the US or wherever they are, uh, come to the chamber and say, can you help us set up the system? Because we're used to this in Germany. Um, they're also the link, kind of like the networker, the body, the facilitator that communicates with the school and the company if there are any issues. The Chamber of Commerce is the facilitator for these programs. And you can actually, there are two more graphs that you can just, yeah, you can keep going. More. <laughs> All right, so um, for the ones that are not 100% familiar with the system, um, our vocations or our programs run anywhere between two and three and a half years. Um, 70 to 80% are taught within the company setting. 20 to 30% are taught within the school setting. So that's a very big difference to a lot of programs that we see here in the United States or anywhere in the world, actually. The Austrians are really good at it, too. <laughs> um, so this is how we set it up here as well. It's, it's mostly hands-on and just part in theory. You can keep going. Um, just maybe another 
information. Um, it's not just the German-American Chamber of Commerce that is doing this. Again, I more have of a bird's eye view. We have 130 offices in 90 countries worldwide, and 40 countries of these are helping set up programs uh, of these kind in their respective countries. So I talked to Mexico, which you actually were at last week? Yesterday. Yeah, yesterday in Mexico, okay. Um, our Mexican colleagues are setting up these programs for German or any company that wants to participate in these programs, actually. I talk to Chile, Argentina, Russia, Australia, almost on a daily basis, because we're all doing the same thing to the same quality level, and this is something very important and that Mark and Martin are gonna talk about as well. It's not just setting up an apprenticeship program, it's the quality of teaching and the curriculum that's a core part of this. Um, so we can go on. So, Steffi, let me, let me stop you there. So how, how does America rank in terms of setting German apprenticeship programs up versus some other countries that you guys work in? Um, we're getting there. We're trying. Um, <laughs> so we're behind. Uh, we're very behind when it comes to that, yes. Um, and it's, it's a mindset that needs to be changed. Again, it's a very common European system um, that not only the Germans and the Austrians, the Swiss, the British, actually the Japanese um, have a program of this kind. So it's a mindset change. Um, and since, again, the country, this is one of our biggest issue, is so big and industry is so spread, um, it's hard to set up a consortium or you know a cluster that we did here, which we're very fortunate we could. But a lot of times the the con uh, company is on its own out in the wild, and um, they have to set up programs that are just company specific, which does not have the same effect if you do it in a consortium. But I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we Germans love numbers, so we have 350 um, state-recognized training occupations that are training after this model. We have um, about 1.5 million apprentices each year in these programs. I keep telling everyone, the conductor that you see on the train, the baker you buy your bread from, your hairdresser, and your machinist are trained within the system. So they've been through two, three years of dual training in the respective profession that they're working in. Um, we can go on. And I brought some um, documents or forms here. Um, I have all of this uh, in digital form. So if you want to shoot me an email, I can send you all of this. I have a couple sample curriculums. I have industry mechanics and mechatronics. Um, I have the dual vocational training system brochure, which goes more in depth of the whole history, how long and why, what, where, when. Um, and also one that might be very interesting and important to a lot of you if you need to argue why you're doing this. It's a um, cost benefit analysis of this training system. It's in Euro, but it's not hard to translate that. Um, but it's also, it's very important a lot of times to go to your stakeholders or your CEOs and you know, argue why you want to set up a program like this, so this might help as well. Um, what does this lead to? It leads to the lowest youth unemployment rate in any industrialized nation in the world. We're at 7.7, .7, I think, at this point. We have 7.8 up there. Um, the U.S. is roughly around 15 to 17, depends on which year you look at and how you calculate. Um, so this has been, it's been our backbone of the economy. It's been the backbone of our industry. It's why why we let through 2008, 2009 in, in a very strong way and, and you know the economy didn't defer us from, from growing and striving. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, just a couple benefits um, for the industry. You're gonna hear more from the industry, um, AKA Martin, <laughs> um, on why they're doing this, but you build your own workforce. You build your own skilled labor. You build a loyalty of a young person to your company um, that you will have for several years, and that's not gonna leave for the dollar more at the other company across the street that has inhaled, that has lived your company, um, and that you actually have for a long, long time. And the young people, um, my, my favorite saying always is, if, if you go into a room with, with young adults, 
and you ask them what they want to be, they say, I'm going to go to Georgia Tech. No, what would you like to be? I'm going to MIT. I'm going to Clemson. I'm going to KSU. No, what do you actually want to be? They don't have an answer. They don't know. And I think the, the college and university system in the U.S. is too expensive to figure out what you want to be for four years and then don't have a job and leave with debt. So here you earn credentials, you earn um, a college degree, you earn a certification that's renowned worldwide and, and known throughout the industry, um, and you actually earn a living while you train. And I think that's, that's the best system that you can think of right now. And for us, it's not exporting the German model. That's not what it's about. It's taking the best parts of it and finding the right setting here in the United States, adapt it a little bit, but also not lose the quality of this program because the quality of the program is what made it live for centuries. Um, I think we can go to the next one. Um, just some of the challenges that we run into here in the U.S. Um, again, in Germany, we have a ministry, a, a part of the government that's in charge of these education and training programs. Everything is very decentralized here. Um, again, I cover 11 states, so if I think I've figured it out in Georgia, I cross state line to South Carolina, and I don't know what the heck's going on. Um, it's very hard for us to understand how frazzle these systems are and there's a lot of times it's not just a state by state it's a college by college it's a county by county approach um, very few industry and and school relations that's getting way better actually we we see a lot of those happening on an internship level or whatever it may be these are great examples of public private partnerships that are you know coming up um, High cost, actually, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. There's no cost involved in this program. But a lot of times, the company-specific programs that I also support, the company pays the tuition of college for the students. So a lot of companies are not liking that part of it. The Germans, I'm not going to say they don't mind, but they're used to it. They know training costs. If you talk to an American company, they want the person they're going to hire ready to go and not be in charge of any of that. Um, I think one of the last uh, topics there is the one that we all struggle the most with. Um, learning a trade is uncool. The stigma that comes with manufacturing still where minds are stuck in the 60s and 70s and this is dirty and the end of the road career ending uh, job, um, it's it's definitely the start of the career and not the end of the career. If you walk into any uh, advanced manufacturing plant at this point, you can eat from the shop floor. So that whole mind change that we have to do, all of us, with the schools, with the parents, with the students, um, actually is one of our biggest challenges that we're running into. But we're, we're getting at it. Um, distance, I talked before. And um, yeah, the end, we already talked about the last one. I think I'm done. I can talk for another hour, but that's kind of like the highlights so, of... So, Steffi, the, the program that uh, was developed he, for here, industrial um, mechanics, mm -hmm. uh, that program had to be vetted by the German chamber. So you had to send all the work that we did mm -hmm. to Germany they had to stamp it and say, yes, okay, good to go. Yes. Well, we actually, we mapped um, our curriculum, which is 100 pages right there, and uh, the curriculum here, we mapped it together and then had to figure out, are the hours the same, are the credits the same, or do we have to put more math into it or more whatever it was, welding, and, and, and Kenny and, and his crew did all that, of mapping what we actually already have here in place. A lot of times colleges or career academies have these courses, they're just taught in different ways and they're not connecting to the extent with the industry that we are. Um, but yes, I had to send all that to Germany. They had to vet it that we do the 20, 30% um, percent theoretical, 70, 80% technical to award these certifications because we're, we can't just give out um, a certificate that speaks of a certain quality 
Um, not everyone is going to receive that. We have two companies here in the United States at this point in the South, which I cover, that are awarded these certificates. And this consortium, that's going to be the third one. Okay. Um, Steffi, so again, th this is not about a certificate for completing the program. This is about certificates that measure competency. That's correct, yes. Okay. Well, I guess it's my turn uh, talking about uh, GA CAT. Uh, well, how did we start the whole thing? Well, we looked into, you know, what is necessary here, and uh, definitely, if I just take my example, uh, my shop, I have an average age of 48, 15 years of tenure, and uh, with the scary, you know, thought out there that most of my employees will retire pretty soon, within the next five to ten years. And uh, really tough to rehire that talent here without uh, in-depth technical training. So we worked with uh, uh, the uh, CEC here more than four years before we started this program. Uh, we had interns over. We at that time already called them intentionally um, apprentices. Uh, we started in our engineering department and then later on uh, moved out into our shop, into our welding department and now in the electrical department and uh, other manufacturing areas where we brought in and still bring in um, students from the CEC that are here as a junior or a senior and work for us for half the day, uh, the whole school year. And actually, if they want, also in the summer. And with that experience, it was uh, possible to, to gauge what is necessary to make a real German apprenticeship program reality. And um, if you Martin, let's let, let's stop a second and help us understand the history of Grinzebach. Uh, and you've been doing apprenticeship for a long time, yes. and you did internship here at the university level before we started it at the high school level. Yes, Grinzebach as a company um, always had apprentices. That's actually, as you mentioned earlier, in Germany it's very normal to have at least a couple of uh, occupations. At the moment, we are able to train 15 occupations in our German headquarters uh, in the apprenticeship model. We also have the industrial mechanic in Germany that we train. And uh, we were doing this since 1960, since we started. Uh, actually, it's an integrated part of every German company. Even if you're a smaller company, you work with bigger companies in your area, and you team together uh, to you know, uh, support your own shop there. Um, what we did here in the U.S., we started uh, an uh, intern uh, program in the university level probably eight years ago and uh, still carrying on that. But this is for university level where university students that went through the K-12 system in Germany, uh, we don't have a K-12 system, but we have also 12 grades, and that's the direct track into university. These uh, students will not have hands-on training, and a lot of universities require hands-on training, internships, and that's what we offer to them, what we offer since eight years. Um, <clears throat> we said we have to start a little earlier because these guys are in the mid-20s, early mid-20s. We have to start earlier. We have to get the students earlier into these programs. Uh, that was the whole focus of uh, partnering up with the CEC, with the seniors, with the juniors, but uh, that didn't go far enough for me. I told Mark always, I want to have the, the sophomore. I want to have uh, the 15-year-old. The I want to start when uh, the German apprenticeship program is intentionally started with a very young student, um, a talent that you can shape over years. Um, into um, an employee that is very skilled and you can use in different areas around your shop, around your office, around your company. So Martin, important point, uh, we don't start at 15 because we decided we wanted to start at 15. We start at 15 because that's the way the German apprenticeship system works. Yes. In Germany, <clears throat> one track of the track school system, you probably have heard that, uh, ends at ninth or 10th grade, it really depends which track you took. And then more or less you enter the workforce and you enter into an apprenticeship program. About 55% of students do that. Um, and just going back in my own history, um, uh, 
most of my friends, I think 90% of my friends went into an apprenticeship program. And um, it was always said, I did not, unfortunately, uh, looking back. Um, it was always said uh, they had a lot of money to spend. They had the newest cars. They went on vacation to Italy. <laughs> and I was, you know, the, the poor student, couldn't afford nothing. But anyways, um, that's um, what the apprenticeship system does. It helps you to get skills, but also earn a living, as you mentioned before. And we wanted to copy it as exact as possible, but also work within the US uh, school system and live, uh, work with uh, what we have here. So uh, we cannot you know, directly copy it, but adapt to the system here. Yeah, so Martin, a part of the reason that we wanted the curriculum based through the technical college system is not only that um, students and parents wanted post-secondary credentials, but it's because apprenticeship in Germany is a post-secondary experience. It comes after high school. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. if we go to the next slide, I think what is important uh, when you just lead into that, we made sure when we set up this uh, apprenticeship uh, uh, system that it's not just something for Coweta County. It's not just something for Granziva. It's something that we can share with others. Again, that's part of the, the system in Germany. You're doing this for your whole community, for your whole state, for your whole country, and not for your own good and just for your own ROI. Of course, this is driven by that, but if you generate a pipeline big enough that can support you know, your area, you will always have a, a pool to tap in for different uh, skills that you need. So um, we're really glad that uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Casey Cagle, um, in the form of uh, Irene, came along and uh, <laughs> really supported that program because it was necessary to change a couple laws to uh, be able to uh, mimic the German system, starting work at 15. Um, we will talk about this later on. In, uh, in person, it's uh, Senate Bill 2. but. <laughs> Um, the German-American Chamber, for us as a German company, there is no question that's the only uh, place to go if you look for a curriculum that has the German quality, that has the German rigor, and the uh, technical skill content that we want for the uh, workforce that we have. And, and Martin, the credentialing, uh, that seems to be important for German companies. Uh, you can send that person anywhere. Yes, actually, what we do a lot um, in times when we have fluctuating uh, load in our different shops. We have actually manufacturing in Germany, in China, and in the US. And uh, we balance the load also with sending our people into different uh, workshops. So at the moment, for example, I have two of my welders working in Germany, because Germany is super busy, and I'm not at the moment. I had times when machinists from Germany were here and helped me in my machine shop. So at that time, it comes really uh, to an important point where I can compare the credentials that I know he went through that training, industrial mechanic in our case, and knows you know, his trade, he knows his skills. And also I know that I can put him on this machine and don't have to care about you know, every single detail. He, he will know how to work. Can you talk about one of those welders who's in Germany now? Yeah, I started talking about this already. It was uh, when we um, brought in the first intern from the CEC in our workshop. He started working in our welding department. And uh, this young gentleman actually um, did so well that uh, after he was done with interning for a year with us, working half a day uh, in the work-based learning program here, um, we offered him a job right out of high school. Actually, his first job. and. Um, he was 17, and I'm, I'm still not over it, but um, he couldn't drive a forklift at that time because you have to be 18 according to OSHA rules to drive a forklift, operate a crane. But uh, at the moment, he is 18. Actually, he's celebrating his 19th birthday now in Germany. I think the last week he had his birthday in Germany. So I hope he drank a beer because that's legal there. <laughs> 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 um, the interesting point about the skill level is that uh, we train our um, different uh, 
trades um, according to the same standard because to our customers, we, uh, we sell Grenzebach quality and uh, we made sure all over the world it's the same. So in the welding program, for example, we have a welding engineer in Germany that certifies all the welders that we have all around the globe. So the ones in Germany, the ones in China, also the ones that we have here in the US. Uh, every three years, <clears throat> he's doing a, a test, comes over, you have to weld a couple uh, different plates together and um, uh, different styles of welding. Uh, all that will get sent out to an external company that will test your we welding quality. And this young gentleman that we've been talking about um, went through the same testing uh, um, earlier this year and actually he made all the tests, he aced all of them. And I couldn't say that for all of my welders. I had a couple welders that did not make all the tests. So you see if you train them right, if you get them early, you can get the results that you need. And um, actually, I just got off the phone earlier with my colleague in Germany. And he is really glad that we could send him these two welders because they're really professional. They don't need hand holding. They could just throw them parts in the drawing and they would start welding. And that's what they would need to be efficient and uh, comply with the jobs that we have. Yeah, so this young man, during his junior year, uh, while he was here in school, he was at East Coweta High School and at Central Educational Center, he finished um, a West Georgia Technical College welding certification. Uh, then his senior year, he spent half a day all year long with you. You hired him at age 17. Um, I think among the problems that you might have encountered was he wasn't old enough for the re retirement program. Yeah, we had to, <laughs> you know, keep him on a waiting list for uh -huh. our 401k. That uh, is another thing that you run into. <laughs> yeah, so we, we just don't think about these things in America, do we, Steffi? We haven't, we haven't created that system yet that um, allows these young people that kind of induction into these opportunities where they're making much higher wages at much younger ages. Yeah, as you said, and, and as Martin said, I mean, uh, some of the preconditions in Germany are different. We have ninth, 10th, and 12th grade, um, you know, different levels of, of graduation in Germany. But I see a lot of changing here, and, and I think Kenny can, can speak to that too. I mean, the demand will drive it. It's it's bottom up. Everything I see, um, I'm in Washington quite a bit, and sitting with the DOL and the DOE and the DOC, and um, obviously commerce, you know, kind of gets it the most because they want you know their companies to strive. And again, this is, is not a, a German industry issue or a German. Uh, solution. This is a manufacturing challenge that each and every one has right now that the car dealerships have. Um, skilled labor is lacking. And I think with the programs that are up, um, there have been, you know, articles in German newspapers of the German dual vocational training system is our number one, you know, export product at this point. And, and no kidding, it is around the world. I've been here 10 years and I've never had a buzz about a topic or something that we do like this ever before. Yeah, so Martin, it's not just for German companies, so could you talk about all these German companies that we have in that industry <laughs> consortium? Yeah, um, let me go through from the top. So what was sure. very important for us was the technical college system of Georgia because we want to be able to replicate the system. It should not be something that's specific for Coweta County and just us here. Uh, so that's why we brought the uh, technical college system in and uh, we were really glad that uh, Kenny and his team worked so diligently to help us uh, translate the uh, uh, curriculum from Germany and not just translate, more or less merge it together with what was existing and add new certificates. So, so we actually had to start by asking Steffi to get the curriculum and translate it into English so that Kenny could then sit down with the curriculum and what we're already teaching and map out the competencies and make sure we had matchups and where we didn't create the things that we needed to create. Correct. Yeah. And um, also, um, well, here, the CEC, what you see here with the students, I think it's very important because that mimics uh, very much a German vocational school. It does, it does not copy it, but it's very, very similar. So that's why the CEC is more or less the catalyst for us for this program, because it puts together the school system, uh, the business and industry, and the technical college system. 
These are all the parts that also go into a place in Germany, just that it's uh, the, the, the chambers in Germany, the industry uh, representatives there, and the vocational schools. So CEC is very important in that program um, with the school system and the technical college. And then about, um, about four years ago, uh, our school superintendent and I came out to see you. Yeah. So I remember this vividly. We're in our meeting room and uh, we discussed how the school system, how the CEC could help an employer like Grenzebach. And I told you, um, I want to have uh, younger students earlier in professions, ideally in a German apprenticeship program. And at that time, we openly said to everybody, we have a secret plan that we'll tell everybody, we'll set up a German apprenticeship program. It was a conspiracy. <laughs> and uh, somehow we came through with that, yeah. yeah. So thank you again for this <laughs> support. And uh, thank you, you know, Steve Barker for doing that. It's our uh, superintendent here. Thank you for creating the conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the industry consortium was another thing. Um, we said when we went out in the very beginning that we will definitely do this even if it's one single student because we are convinced that this is working. But uh, of course it makes more sense if it's more than one student. And uh, what I did, I called the other German company here in the county, uh, that's EGO, and I talked with uh, their president, uh, David Keller, and asked him. And of course being a German company, there's no question. I said, sure Martin, I'm in, so what can I do? And uh, he really pushed that we should get a lot more um, companies involved, a lot more students to begin with. Uh, that would make it much easier to handle the project and uh, to handle the students and the education. So uh, with Georgia Tech's uh, extensionship for uh, manufacturing partnership. Georgia Tech's, yeah, Georgia Manufacturing Extension Partnership at Georgia Tech, yeah, yeah. Yep, um, with them <laughs> we found more uh, companies here in the county actually we're part of their lean consortium that's a consortium where uh, that um, Georgia Tech brought together to do best practice visits to understand what each other uh, what each other company could do for them and um, so we knew the other companies like Yamaha case and Yokogawa Winpack KCMA and Groovebin already and it was easier for us to convey the message what we want to do with this work-based learning program that will morph into an apprenticeship program. And it was very interesting to see at the end that we have quite a multicultural uh, group together with uh, three Japanese companies, mm -hmm. Yamaha, Yokogawa, and um, uh, KCMA, uh, Kawasaki Manufacturing uh, Company, and um, also a Canadian company with mm -hmm. Winpac, mm -hmm. and two American companies. I was pleasantly surprised about that. That's Kaysen and Groovepin. Actually, I should not be because these are family-owned businesses and I think they get it more than corporates. Uh, I spoke with a, another corporate company here in the county and that was two and a half years ago. I pitched the idea, why wouldn't we, couldn't we go together and also try an apprenticeship program? They were very concerned about, well, if we spend so much time and money on the student and later on you more or less rob him from me for a dollar more, I don't want to spend that money. That That's, no. And, it was very hard to convey the message that it's about uh, generating a pipeline. It's not just about the single student. It's not just about your own company. It's about the whole community. And um, that is possible with these companies at the moment. And I'm really glad that we could uh, round up so many. Actually, with these eight, with, between these eight companies, now we started last week with 10 students mm -hmm. that are in the program. and. Um, working as apprentice, industrial so, mechanic. So Martin, the, the, the German approach is very much that the company is an extension of the educational setting. Mm -hmm. So these apprentices, and you'll talk about this later, I know, but these apprentices are not initially there producing a product for the company. In fact, the company is investing in the student. So there's a commitment of resources on the part of the company uh, versus a use of uh, as, as you t termed it, cheap labor. This is not about cheap labor. Absolutely not. And that's a very big misunderstanding a lot of times with American companies that, oh, I get an apprentice, I can put him on a machine, he produces widgets, he's cheap, and maybe in a couple of years he will know what to do. That's not going to happen. You have to train and educate the person from the basic rules of you know, how to 
work with metal, in, in, in our case with industrial mechanic, uh, with the basic parts, and that will take years. It takes three years to get there. Of course, in the third year, you most likely will have him working on a machine or in something more productive than in the first year. But the whole program's focus is not on being a productive employee, but to get trained to be a lot more efficient later on. So after the third year, that would be a person that you can use in all your departments and uh, you know, you could use them in, in any shift to work on any machine. And um, so it's, it's a, a broader skill set than you would have right now. So, so Martin, among the things that you might recommend to this group, um, I, I'm guessing you might recommend that a group like Georgia Tech's Manufacturing Extension Partnership be a part of their work locally because that group at Georgia Tech manages that lean consortium effort around the state of Georgia. They're accustomed to working with manufacturers. Larry Alford, who's our regional manager for that program, couldn't be with us here today, but uh, Larry's been working with you all for 20 years. Yes. Yeah. So that's a person these folks need to get to know in their community if they don't already work with them. I think what is important for the community is the Georgia Tech part. It's the partnership with the schools. Ideally, you have a college and career center, and also your uh, development authority and the chamber. Uh, I think these are all entities you should talk to because all of them will be able to help you in their different ways, but they're all necessary to put the whole puzzle together. Could, could we ask Amanda to take a microphone for just a minute? Amanda. Describe your role um, with existing industries in Coweta County. Let, let's make sure you've got a microphone so you can do that. Okay, Amanda Fields, the existing industries manager, director for the Coweta County Development Authority basically make sure that our companies have what they need to be successful here in Coweta County. So the one thing I hear from them all the time, every time I go into their, into their business, is that they have a need for a workforce. So this program is important to us because it's creating a pipeline of workforce for them for a need that they all have. So that's why we are supporting this program. Amanda, have you been using this program to recruit new companies around the world since it was developed? Absolutely, and we actually have a couple of companies that have said that they've put this on their list of pros as to, you know, when they've got their list of reasons to come and reasons not to come or reasons to go somewhere else. This program is on the list of reasons to, to locate here. So Amanda, you would hope that all these other um, communities stay about four years behind us. Right? Absolutely. If, yeah. if you could actually maybe go 10 years, that would be great. No, I'm just kidding. It's really, I mean, it's it's really a great thing. And I, it's good for the, that's what I was about to say. It's good for the whole state. If, we hope that everybody does have a program like this because we don't only pull employers or employees from Coweta County. We pull them from Fayette County and Fulton County and Clayton County. We want everyone to do this so that our region, our state has a viable workforce. Okay, so let's take the microphone back to Irene Munn. Irene, talk for just a second, if you would, about why Lieutenant Governor Cagle uh, and our economic development interests around the state want to see this statewide. Okay, I thought you were going to let me come and hobble we, we, forward. We will. We will when we get to Senate uh, Bill 2, yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, let me stand back here and um, the Now, what was the question? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Why is this important to economic development in our state? We, we want to replicate this statewide, right? Yes. Okay. All right. And that's because we want to recruit more business and industry for Georgia. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. That was great. <laughs> that was elegantly simple. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving right along. <laughs> yeah, what was important here also to, um, for the, to get all these industries together was uh, the Chamber of Commerce here. Uh, all of these companies are uh, members in the Chamber. And uh, also the Georgia Association of Manufacturers lobbying at uh, the Capitol for you know, enabling Senate Bill 2 that we'll get to in a minute. 
And here we are. Mr. Here we are. <laughs> I thought it was up there soon. Come on up. <laughs> the last time we did this was two weeks ago for um, interested communities, and I had my scooter, and then it had a bell. I, I have this lovely boot now that I can walk around. Um, the first thing I'd like to say, I'm Irene Munn. I work for Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle, and I can't um, tell you how excited that he is, not only me, but he is um, about the interest that's here in this, this room. And the companies that are represented here um, is just really amazing. And so, and I'm also thankful for Martin to say that the, in, that Irene, what'd you say? Some German way of saying that Lieutenant Governor Cagle showed up in the form of Irene Munn. And, <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> um, but here is my card here. Most of you guys know me, um, and all of you College and Career Academy folks for sure know me. And I would like very much to be the contact person for any questions that anybody has as it relates to what the Lieutenant Governor refers to as Georgia Cat. And I'm going to deviate totally from this slide because this will be the only time I'm going to come up here and, and spend time in front of you. But. Um, the, 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 um, there are so many wonderful things going on, as you've already expressed here, and there's so much great work happening all over our state. And there is no doubt this is critical. Workforce is critical to the success of our economy and the success of Georgia. And the Lieutenant Governor talks a lot about how we need to now move towards the, um, the, the ability to promote and celebrate work. And it really doesn't matter what kind of work it is, but we need to be celebrating work. And um, everyone can find success, and every one of your high school students can find success. And the goal is not to get into college, but get into a well-paying job. And this is one, uh, one thing that we're doing right now that he is extremely proud of, and we want to empower any community who can get this right um, to make this a successful program. If, if you are, but there's, it's a lot of work, and we are very, um, we're brand Branding what is Georgia Cat. Um, the Lieutenant Governor signed a memorandum of understanding with the German American Chamber of Commerce to s develop Georgia CATT, Consortium for Ad Advanced Technical Training. That means that if you're going to do a apprenticeship, a, a German apprenticeship program at your high school level, that that student will graduate with the high school diploma, post-secondary credentials, and that German certification in any of those 350 occupations. You're learning a lot about how we started with industrial mechanics, mostly because that was the need of the industry here in Coweta County, who was our partner. But we very much know that there's those 350 other occupations. And I'm also very thankful to the Technical College System of Georgia, who realized that they needed a one-stop shop named Kenny Atkins over here to be their apprenticeship coordinator to really support the work across the board. So, but if you are interested in doing Georgia Cat, please use my card, me as the contact person, that I can help you get every resource you need. Um, we very much want to see other Georgia Cat programs across the state, um, and we will, that you will have the full weight of the Lieutenant Governor and the Lieutenant Governor's office behind you as you move down this road. You also will have the full weight of the Lieutenant Governor's office to help you do other excellent programs, build up your work-based learning, build up great apprenticeship programs that, are, that aren't, that is not getting the German certification, whatever it takes to you, for you to respond to your workforce needs, we want to be helpful to that. But very specifically, if you're looking at doing Georgia Cat, Georgia Cat has a meaning. So just that, that's why I like the idea of calling Georgia Cat, Georgia Cat, because we know what that means means. There are plenty of apprenticeship programs, and we'll help you do that, but that's an apprenticeship program. There's great work-based learning that, you know, with those, 
there's some there's internships, there's co-op, there's the federal apprenticeship program, there's the whatever <laughs> out there. There's tons of stuff going on, but Georgia Cat has a specific meaning. But let me get back on script over here with Senate Bill Two. Um, honestly, the Lieutenant Governor, we we really listened to our college and career academies and knew that our our um, that partnership around um, dual enrollment, our high school students needed that opportunity to fully focus on their post-secondary education and not necessarily that for math, for English, for science, for um, whatever else it is they take. Um, was, was, was somewhat confusing when they could fully focus on their post-secondary work and graduate from high school with a diploma program or a high school or associate's degree. And it just made it a whole lot easier if we passed Senate Bill 2 to bring that um, as another option to our students. And that's the, that was kind of the, the meat of it. And I, there are a ton of Senate Bill 2 kids out there now. And you, know, you probably have them in your, um, in your schools right this very second. And we are very proud of that. But Senate Bill 2 was the method to get to exactly what we're talking about right now. Um, the Lieutenant Governor got the opportunity to go to Germany and he saw a European apprenticeships. And he knew that that was the kind of choice opportunity that there are so many of our students need to have. The ability to truly look towards that that type of educational opportunity um, that that again not everybody in in the United States is going to become apprentice we're not going to all of a sudden become this European apprenticeship model that's not going to happen overnight I and mean, it probably will never happen at all we're America we're not we're going to do it the American way but there is no doubt there is a huge value to not only our employers but to our students that we move to in this direction to give this type of opportunity to those students and every single one in this room knows a student that would love to do this. And I might be jumping ahead, but I am amazed when you guys take a look at the approximately, what, 100 students in Coweta County who had an interest in it and their families, and then the 20 students, no, 30-something students. 31 tests. 31 students and had their mom and daddy say, yes, it's okay, in ninth grade to take the compass test to be program eligible for industrial mechanics. So in ninth grade, they are, are college level ready. In ninth grade, they're ready to go to college. Um, and so those 30-something students tested, 20 of them passed the compass test in ninth grade. And then those, then 19 of those actually competed for the 10 slots, apprenticeship slots. And the, the idea of what those students had to go through just to, to the, just the character building of taking a, a college level test, making application, and then interviewing at the company, being a, a mature enough to talk to company leaders to then be selected as an apprentice. I think it's just amazing. And, and, it, and it's not amazing because they were unique. To me, it's amazing that we don't let them do it already. I mean, they, there's nothing unique about these kids. I mean, the, the young man that Martin chose is, is what, it, I like him. He's like me. He's a good old boy. I mean, it, he is just as, as, as wonderful as you can get. Um, he should grow up in Cartersville or Coweta, Noonan. That's where he grew up. But y'all get my point about these are just good kids that are more than capable and ready to have this type of opportunity available to them. So we are overjoyed that Coweta County is doing this. Um, and again, anybody out there who wants to do this program, uh, the Lieutenant Governor's Office stands ready to support you um, in any of the different educational opportunities you provide to your students. But very specifically, let me be your point person for Georgia Cat, and I'll get you all the different resources you need to put your partnership together to make this happen. Actually, Irene, I have a question. You yourself went to Germany in fall 2014. So what was the eye-opening moment of that trip besides the great it, beer and wine? It, and the, the, it was my privilege to, um, to, that's one of those Martins where I got to, the Lieutenant Governor in the form of Irene Munn showed up in Germany. Um, and um, it was just a wonderful opportunity. Thank you, German Foreign whoever paid for it, foreign, um, ministry. foreign ministry. And um, I, the, the thing that, that got me the most was when we went to the Ford Motor Company plant in Cologne, Germany, 
and that and the recognition that every year there are 250 kids that are accepted as apprentices at the age of 15 at the Ford plant there 3,000 15 year olds are competing for those 250 slots and th the 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 just what's going on the quality of employee that's coming in or, or student at 15 that's living up to that type of a competitive environment is what we talk about trying to get into Georgia Tech but this is trying to get an industrial mechanics certification for the Ford Motor Company fund and I, that was just really I was I was amazed at, um, at at how that was, and also I was amazed at re the recognition, y'all. This work for all you educators in the room. This is not work for you. For all you business leaders in the room, you're about to step up the plate and do a 80 percent of the education that goes on for that senior. So 80% of their time, they're not in your school building, they're over at the employer's site using the employer's equipment, being trained by an employer's person. So no longer does education pay for the equipment or the, or the teacher. But guess what education's getting for that student? The FTE, because you're giving them the course credit for it. And not only you're giving them the course credit for it, but the college is also giving them the course credit for it, and they're collecting the FTE for it. But you didn't pay for any of that equipment. That's a game changer if you are providing opportunities in that way and a total different mind shift than what we do in the United States where we're the one that pays for all the equipment. And then, of course, with our capital equipment grants, Dwayne, we, <laughs> we're three years before we even can purchase the equipment. And then once you get to purchase the equipment, you don't get to ask for equipment for what another maybe five or six years so you're working on equipment that is probably 10 years old and the employer is purchasing equipment when they need it because they've got a productivity responsibility that they got to push out the door so we're going to take out take kids through a, a course on equipment 10 years old but they're uh, the georgia cat kids are learning on equipment that they're actually working on and it's it is a when if we could do this in a in a and again, we're not, we're, we're Americans and then we become Georgians are even stronger than that. We're not gonna totally transform this, but this is for sure an opportunity that we can provide the choice opportunity for our students instead of this one size fits all pathway to college. We now have multiple pathways for our students to find success into the workforce. I just wanna add something. No, you, you're good. Um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that uh, the curriculum is written by the industry. It's not written by the educator. It's not written by the chamber. It's, it's not written by any school system. The industry writes the curriculum and no one else. So, so Martin, while we're on this, this idea that, that Irene's talked about, that Steffi's talked about, that you've talked about, this culture mindset shift, talk about Miriam who's the first person I ever met from Germany who went through the industrial mechanics program. I think Miriam was about 5'3", and probably about 90 pounds. Mm -hmm. And she finished the industrial mechanics apprenticeship program at Grinzebach. Yes, actually uh, in Germany, in the area where we're located, uh, they went a step further. What they, took, what they did, they took the industrial mechanic apprenticeship program and added on um, a master and bachelor's degree in engineering. And Miriam... Wait, so, so you mean doing this program doesn't limit a student's options? Absolutely not. It actually enhances the chances you have later in life because the best engineers we have in our company went through the apprenticeship program. And uh, going back to Miriam, yes, uh, she's uh, a student that started as an apprentice um, in the, in, as an industrial mechanic, and she actually enjoyed most, we asked her, the welding part. Hmm. And um, after that, she liked it so much, uh, working with the engineers that came and gave her the drawings, that she said, I want to be the one that also makes the drawings, and that's why she went on to get her bachelor's and uh, while she was here, she was actually working on a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Hmm. Wow. So Steffi, 40% of the young people who go through apprenticeship programs in Germany are female. They are, yes, and, and they're not only the, the nurses and the mm -hmm. Cosmo, 
what are they called? Cosmetology. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard word. Yeah. Um, they're they're in technical programs. I mean, obviously they're you know lesser percentage in technical programs, females. But we actually have one out of the ten that started last yeah. week in their program um, mm -hmm. here in Coweta County is a female. So yeah. a, a lot of you know females go through technical programs in Germany as well. Great, great. I want to touch on something that Irene mentioned. Actually, two words. First was choice. The second was uh, competitiveness. The first choice, so important for us working with the CEC, was every student that is here at the CEC did this by choice. It's not because mom and daddy or somebody sent him because he wanted to go to the CEC. He wanted to experience something different. The, the school didn't make them. Yeah, their high school didn't force them to do this. Yeah. yeah. So that's an important part in the mindset of the student, of the talent that we want to hire later on. The other one is being competitive. We said from the very beginning we want to copy the German model where it makes sense and where it definitely makes sense is that we're not giving away these apprenticeship uh, positions, but you got to fight for them. So it was really helpful and great to see at the end we had 20 possible candidates where we had to choose uh, 10. So it was a competitive situation. The students had multiple interviews at different employers that had to come. Um, and more, more or less work through a regular interview that we would have with everybody else. So that was their more or less first life lesson for this uh, apprenticeship program that is necessary later on. They can build on and say, I went through a, an interview and that's what was expected, that was what we did. And um, I shouldn't be surprised because I know of the quality of the students, but I was surprised. All the students that came, came either dressed in a tie very neat uh, clothing and had a CV prepared, as much as you can have it as a high school student, but they were really prepared to talk about their life and what they want to do. And that was amazing to see how ready these students are for this uh, apprenticeship program. So we worked, uh, Dr. Steve Humphrey, in fact, worked closely with Larry Alford to try to align uh, student interest. He asked them which companies they were most interested in he asked the employers which students they were most interested in. They tried to align those interests, and then you got to pick who you wanted to interview, and you got to choose who you wanted to choose. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit for just a second about the, uh, the, the young person that you chose. Yeah, so of course one of the questions was, um, what does... Um, makes you the best student for this program? Why do you think you're the best? And what are your skills that you already have developed? Because you would probably have some mechanical skills. And the one that we hired at the end, um, um, he came in and said, I have my own lawn mowing business. I said, OK, that's interesting. So what do you do? Um, do you repair anything on your equipment? I said, sure, yeah. And we asked, what, you just changed the spark plug? I said, no, no, no. If the engine's broke, I'll take it apart and put it back together. And of course, with the help of my dad, but you know, I try to do as much as I can, and that's pretty impressive at an age of 15 to try to run your own business besides of school, to work mechanically on your own equipment, and um, that definitely sparked the interest in us, and uh, finally hired him on that. Great, thank you. So, Jake, if you. Well, I think we can browse through these pretty quickly. We touched on most of them, what the German-American Chamber did, bringing in the curriculum. Um, again, as we said, for us it was very important to have the rigorous technical details of the uh, German curriculum. The technical college system was necessary to make sure it's replicable throughout the whole state, and it's not just something in an island here. And uh, West Georgia Technical College um, uh, is our local college that will dual enroll the students, that uh, will work with the students. So that's what is necessary here. And uh, at the end, um, we'll give out the degrees too. Jay. So the CEC, I spoke about the CEC quite a bit. Uh, for us, still the primary support mechanism for this whole program. We couldn't do it without the CEC. And we wouldn't want to do it without the CEC because all the um, experience comes together here with the vocational trainings, with the different programs, with the work-based learning, with the connections to the high school, with the connections to the, to the um, technical college. Um, so it's the ideal place to do that. 
and um, you know, assisting uh, the students is a, a big part of this program um, over the years because you're talking about 15-year-old uh, students and they need a little more than maybe an 18-year-old. But on the other hand, I want the 15-year-old because that's a person I can shape way bigger in, the, in a technical uh, skill than I can do with an 18-year-old, for example. I'm trying. Um, so we worked with the technical college system and uh, West Georgia Technical College and the CEC through a, um, a curriculum and came up with the schedule. Um, again, it's very important, a lot of hands-on training. German system, 80% of uh, the training must be hands-on, ideally at the employer. Um, we focused here on the, in the first year, so it starts in 10th grade. Um, it will go through the summers, so that was uh, a news for the students. We told them you will not have your full summer anymore. You have to go through summer school, actually the, the college uh, version of it. And uh, But on the other hand, you will be working, earning money. Uh, that's another big thing in the whole program. You will see dollar signs be behind all the blue um, labeled uh, uh, parts in the schedule. This is when the student is at the employer. And uh, we said another part we want to take from the German uh, system is that uh, you compensate the students for being an apprentice. And we said $8 an hour the first year, um, 10 the second, and 12 the third year. Uh, third year being uh, the year with uh, the most exposure, uh, so earning a lot more money and being more proficient. The industrial con uh, consortium between the companies I mentioned before uh, we worked together on the curriculum, gave our input, and uh, made suggestions uh, with the technical college what to ch change and what to focus on. Next one. Okay. What? Okay, let's, let's stick with that. Um, I think what uh, was important to have a couple of ground rules between these uh, eight companies. And the most important one is uh, that we said we as a smaller company, for instance, we have 100 people working here in Noonan, um, we couldn't compete with uh, Yamaha having 2,500 uh, people working here in Coweta County. So we said we want to have a uniform wage scale um, for these um, uh, students. So what I mentioned, $8, $10, and $12 between the three years. Uh, no benefits uh, because they're still insured with the parents. They have to prove that they have medical insurance and the service year is the West Georgia technical curriculum year. Then um, we said, you know, a couple other rules. Uh, they will have uh, time of service accumulation that will go against, you know, later on against their benefits. So the three years they're in the program, they actually work for us already. They're on our payroll. Um, that means when they're done, they're already three years uh, tenure with us. And um, they have to apply to the general rules like handbooks and uh, other rules that companies have. And at the end of the program, that's the ultimate goal. We will, of course, offer them a job. Um, and if necessary, we'll cover the tuition to finish the associate's degree. But it really depends on the student, where he is within the program. The student could finish the associate's degree. Uh, or could not, but it doesn't matter. Anyhow, we will pay for the tuition if it's necessary to add another year uh, in the uh, technical college system. Great, great. So they're accumulating service time with you as if they're already employed. Um, you're paying them along the way, so they're going to uh, walk away after high school with about $25,000 uh, from the pay that you provide to them. They're going to have a high school diploma. They're going to have at least uh, a West Georgia Technical College diploma, if not the associate degree, and you'll help them finish the associate degree. They're going to have the German certification. Uh, they're going to have a job offer. And uh, jobs, thirty dollars to $40,000 a year uh, to, to start. Uh, and they'll be 18 years old. Pretty good deal, pretty good deal. Kenny, talk a little bit about the work that you did to put all this together, because what we want to help folks know is the work's been done. We did four years. You've spent 18 months of your life on it. 
Um, if they want to do industrial mechanics, the, they don't have to go through all that work again. The good news is the homework's already been done. Well, but when we started with the German apprenticeship standards, that was, that was the, the goal because you know, without having, you know, without training to those standards, then we don't have a German apprenticeship program. So we started with that and we took all the competencies that were in those, that set of standards and we mapped those two competencies that we typically train. We, we may call them different things. We can call it industrial maintenance. We can, uh, but in Germany, they call it industrial mechanics. But the competencies are, are very similar. And then we identified those courses that we, that we typically teach and, 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 and said, we, we, will, we can train this set of competencies. We also, we've also found some things that we don't have the capability to train. For example, you mentioned a little bit earlier, we may be operating on, on equipment that's 10 years old or older, and, and the, the businesses, you have uh, new milling machines and things like that, that we just don't have at the technical college system, or we don't have in the right locations because we don't train all programs in all locations. So we identified what we can train, we identified what we can't train, and then in conversation with the participating companies, then we, the, then we delineated the responsibilities, says okay, you can train this at the, at the facility, and we'll train this at the schoolhouse, and, and it worked out very well. We front-loaded the academics because we, we, we wanted to give them the, the fundamentals before they actually started working uh, on the machinery. So the, the schedule of courses dictates that the students go more in the early years, go, go you know, spend more time at the schoolhouse more in the early years, and then uh, the junior and senior years, they spend most of their time at the manufacturing facility. Kenny, let, let me stop you right there because you worked with Steffi in the German chamber so that they could understand that when they're in that lab at West Georgia Technical College, that approximates the German system of having them on the job working. So the time that was spent in those labs accumulated toward the required time that allows them to sit for certification. Is that accurate? Yes, yeah. that's, uh, that's correct. Um, our systems are slightly different in that in, in Germany, the technical college does mostly academic work mm -hmm. and, and they get all of the job related lab activities actually at the, uh, at the manufacturing facility. We have a lot of our, our lab equipment and labs here at our technical colleges so they can spend a lot of their time there at the schoolhouse and not take that equipment offline at the manufacturing facility for training purposes. So Kenny, this is one of the things that I learned when Martin brought his HR director here from Germany. They said, yeah, this school approximates uh, our Berufsschule, the, the vocational school in Germany but we don't understand why does your school have all this equipment? Because in Germany, that equipment's at the manufacturer. Uh, that's correct. And, and that's the, one of the reasons why this, this type of program is so very important, is as good as our technical college system is, and we've got a very good technical college system in Georgia, the way we train our skilled trades, we just can't keep up with the demand the way we have typically been doing it. So we need this additional avenue to, to help grow the, the, the increasing demand for skilled trades. Just like Martin said, most his, his, his talent is 40, 50, 60 years old, and all of that talent is gonna get getting ready to retire. So, so it's so very important to start growing that pipeline that, that he mentioned to supplement what we're already doing. Steve Cromer, you are Senior Director for Advanced Manufacturing at West Georgia Tech, and 
what does that mean that you're doing day to day in your role? One of the things that takes up a large part of my time is visiting with industry, uh, looking at the job site, looking at the skill sets uh, that are required of the employees, looking at the uh, equipment, the technology, the machinery that the technicians there are working on and bring that technology and information back to the college to ensure that we are training what is not only relevant but what is uh, the future demand in production facilities. Steve, you went to Germany. What, what did you find when you studied the German apprenticeship system? Yeah, I went to Germany back in April and um, had so many takeaways from that. Um, I think what's most relevant today to tell you is that uh, something you mentioned earlier, Mark, about the measure of competency. And one of the big takeaways I had from my visit to Germany was when I visited with uh, one of the instructors there uh, at Felix Feckenbach College. Uh, his name was Kai. He was a very interesting instructor. And one of the things that we do extremely well here in the United States is we measure our students constantly and often. And the way we do it is we open up our grade books and see how many A's and B's they got. And those A's and B's are derived from taking tests and preparing our students to take tests. But that's not helping our employers, not at all. What's so incredibly different in approach with the German model is that when I met with Kai those several days in Germany, I asked him how he evaluates his students' performance and how they are uh, graded. He opens up what to me looked like a gray book, and it didn't have A's and B's and C's and D's or F's, but instead it was an evaluation of a project that a student had worked on. So theirs truly is performance-based grading on project learning. It's not about regurgitating information they studied the day before to take a test so that they can make an A. That's not the point of it. So with that, I'm not going to say it's, it was a transformative moment, but I will say it was a very strong reaffirmation of my thoughts was that we've got to change our approach. So here at West Georgia Technical College, I can tell you that our uh, grading system, we'll still have the A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's, but it will be project-based grading, not sitting in a classroom for an hour teaching a student how to take a test. And I can tell you that because I've been in the technical college system after 16, almost 17 years. I've served as an instructor in avionics technology and as a dean for academic affairs and now in this capacity. So I was part of that. I taught students how to take tests really good. And it's wrong. It's just wrong. It's not right for our employers. Our employers need people that have skills that can put them to work, not only in their head, but with their hands. So that was my moment in Germany where I, I really came back with a sense of purpose to redirect our instructors and give our students the real skill sets that our employers need for sustained economic growth. Great, great, thanks. You all have driven a distance. We can either take a break before questions or we can ask questions now and wrap it up. What's your pleasure? Ready for questions? All right. Do we have microphones so that everybody can uh, speak into a microphone? All right. First question is questions. Yes. Working for a development authority, we obviously try to save as much money as we can for our industries and in the recruitment process, every dollar matters. So as far as presenting this idea to our industries, it's going to cost them money. And, um, but I'm looking at the strategic uh, industries. Is there any kind of connection with that, with any of these apprenticeship programs, to try to bring in funding to help the industries fund these apprenticeships or anything like that? Let's ask Amanda Fields to <laughs> talk about how companies, and we'll ask Martin too, talk about how companies have reacted to the notion that 
hey, we've got to invest in this. I have not heard one negative thing from any company. Um, that has not been any, any of the reason that we've had companies choose not to be a part of the program this initial year, that money hasn't been one of them. Um, we have gone above and beyond to make sure that they all know what is involved and knew ahead of time what was involved so that they could make the decision um, as to whether or not they could afford to do this. And they've all stepped up and have had expenses come up that they weren't even expecting in the beginning. Um, and they've all just been great about it. So for us, it has not been a deterrent for any of our companies. They've all figured out a way to make it work, even some of ours that are really very small. So Amanda, is it okay for me to tell folks that you've already gotten a call from a company um, who heard about this program um, and they already want to contribute dollars toward the program? If that's not okay for me what to I say, I won't have? say it. <laughs> If that's not okay for me to say, I won't say it. But we have a we are in discussions with a company um, that is wants to be part of the program financially, um, wants to do some sort of sponsorship, and so we are talking with them about um, possibly purchasing some of the tools that the students will need um, that the companies were not expecting to have to purchase um, in order to alleviate that expense from them. So it's not a done deal, so don't get excited. But um, I, I'm definitely talking with them about that. So that is another avenue that um, is an option that w I didn't even really think about. We were appro I was approached by this company um, asking how they can help. So that is also another. They're a new company, so they weren't ready to be involved in the program as far as having um, a student. But I'm sure that's the next step for them, too. So I just you got, wanna, got companies oh. calling who want to participate financially, but they're not yet getting apprentices. Exactly, okay. exactly. Because they see the benefit, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's easy to see once you know what the program's about. Just other things that I see, because I'm not just Georgia and South Carolina, um, the Charleston Chamber of Commerce, together with Trident Community College down there, the chamber pays the tuition for the students. So there are all kinds of models of how associations, chambers, foundations um, are contributing to these programs. So you just got to find that one partner that's willing to. So let's make the point that in South Carolina, they even have to pay the tuition. Companies don't have to do that here because this is a dual enrollment program and the state is paying that tuition. So we've already got an but advantage. But they got tax incentives. Yeah, we've already had an advantage in Georgia. Um, Dwayne, you were going to make a comment. Yeah. I want to ask a question of our lady from the representing the Georgia Chambers. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name except Stephanie. Okay. It's all good. Except that we're supposed to laugh after the last. Yeah, time. you kind of <laughs> missed that. Yeah. Uh, but you weren't. What involved. I'm curious about, um, I mean, I, I suspect the reason this community was targeted was because of CEC and the businesses who happen to be in this locality. Um, you know probably all the German-based businesses in the state, as well as other high-tech advanced manufacturing businesses, how many communities in Georgia are there that need to replicate this model? Well, everyone needs to, but um, <laughs> well, I, I didn't mean... find this county. Martin actually stalked me. He didn't talk about that. Um, they started all this before I was even in the picture, and he brought in, you know, we're only doing this if we're doing this according to German standards. But um, industry have certain clusters um, here in the state of Georgia. I mean, the whole Gainesville area has, has a large German company cluster. Dalton does. Um, there is not one that's more likely to succeed than the other. I think it's all about the partnership that has to come together. It's all about the industry wanting it. Um, and again, it, it, it's not about the German industry, as we see here. There are two German companies out of eight. Um, so it's about the how I always say, you know, who hurts it the most? It's, it's the industry, and whoever screams the loudest and is hurting the most right now wants these programs. So, Andrea, I know you wanted to comment. Here's a, here's a microphone. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, we represent about... Um, 100 companies that employ half the manufacturing workforce in this state. And we surveyed them a year ago. And this specific industrial mechanics or maintenance is what they are all crying for. And 
as a group that represents manufacturers in this state, this is a crisis. I mean, all the work that our association has done in the area of tax and energy and all the other things that make Georgia extremely competitive, this is the issue, workforce is the issue that our members are really scared about because they can't find these people. And I think it's all over the state. I think I'd also like to make a comment on what Steffi said early up. This is a mindset change. And I think we should all think about it personally um, as parents, those of us who are parents. I have um, three kids who are all launched. And, but I, I really think about my son who was graduated from an in-town Atlanta school. He, his grandfather was a college professor, so we all went to college. And that school was very competitive academically with college-bound kids. Um, he got seven AP classes coming out of high school, went to Georgia, did all the good things. He hit the wall when he didn't, couldn't find a job he had passion about. Um, he was always employed, he took care of himself, but it didn't really click. Um, I would have been mortified as a parent, I think, if he had said, Mom, I want to do this. And I kick myself now because he would have been better off doing this because he likes to make things. And if we look as a state at the number of people who go to college and then turn around and go to a technical college because they can't do anything, we ought to be thinking more globally about the money that we're wasting and the frustration we're causing kids by not helping them find their way. And I have nothing against college, but this is an option that we ought to be showing kids across the state because it makes sense. And that's what, as an association, we're trying to promote. So Andrea and Dwayne, you've made the point about the, the need for this across the state. Steffi, how many programs in America uh, are there with a consortium of companies that teach industrial mechanics to students in an apprenticeship program uh, stamped by the German Chamber uh, those students being as young as age 15. How many are there in America? This one. <laughs> this is the first one? Yes. There, there are other consortium solutions in different states, um, Illinois or Michigan, um, but they start with 18. So this is the very first one in a consortium that does it with, with high school students. Can I ask a question to that? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm actually interested in first IP. And I, we just tweeted about you yesterday, so 50 million barter account. We tagged you. You didn't retweet us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, my question, I actually, it's twofold. Is this something that your headquarter is pushing for, or it's it, you know training these training programs? It's something that you're interested in setting up here, or how far along the way the thought process are you with this? Uh, thank you very much for retweeting us. Or <laughs> you're tweeting you're us. very very uh, welcome. Yes, we announced our third expansion uh, yesterday. We started in 2013 with our mm -hmm. construction and expanded three times since. So we're quite successful here, and uh, we're we're um, having our biggest problem not to get the investments uh, uh, freed up from our corporate, but uh, to find workforce. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, we are ramping up and not in the scale of an automotive OEM, but from zero to 400 uh, in around five years is a challenge. So um, coming from Austria and coming from a system uh, that has that incorporated and First Alpine is the biggest employer of apprentices in Austria. We have our own um, Apprentice school there um, it was visited by by uh, the governor's uh, wife and the and the commission of of several commissioners um, uh, two weeks ago three weeks ago I think um, we do have 1,400 active apprentices in Vostalpina worldwide. Um, so that's so 1,400 active worldwide. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And um, and we we did not 
get a mandate from corporate to do that here. Uh, we just thought it's the best way to do it. And that's why we partnered up very early with uh, the local authorities and uh, Bartow County was very, very helpful um, in, in understanding our needs and uh, uh, it was a good, um, yeah, let's say a good chance that they at the same time started with the College and Career Academy on their own. And we partnered very, very early, even when we didn't have anything in production yet mm -hmm. uh, to start the program together with them. Mm -hmm. So we had the first two apprentices um, in, in 2014, the end of 2014, where we were in business for almost half a year already. So, mm -hmm. um, and we have staffed our, our first trainers from Germany. So uh, we're Austrian, but we have a lot of companies in Germany Yeah, we as don't well. do not discriminate it's, it's totally fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and we have those, uh, those that went through that German system and mm -hmm. are masters in their German system. Um, and um, they're allowed to train, of course, mm -hmm. um, also under the German um, program. Uh, we did not do any official program yet with a state certification, so um, that is something that we want to explore. Um, at the moment, we are very, very happy that it works. Um, let me say several things um, that I heard here and, and, and that I want to comment on, even unasked. Um, first of all, equipment is always a topic uh, that we hear from the, from the education side. Um, don't, don't you want to sponsor new equipment because our, our students need the, the top-notch equipment? This is, in my opinion, a wrong perception, totally wrong, because what you need to teach them in the schools is the basics. So how to take a block of metal and file it down to something and you just need a file for that and you don't need a uh, 3D CNC machine, a milling machine or whatever. So the basics is that that matters because that was, that's what making those students strong in the long run, right? So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is the most important is to convince the parents because they set the tone at the dinner table what the future of their kids going to be, right? So. If you want to win or if you want to be in this uh, um, education model, then you need to, need to talk to the parents uh, first and foremost, right? So uh, we, we started our apprenticeship program with making a contract, um, and Lisa was there several times already, and it, I think it's a very successful model. We bring in this, the apprentices, their parents, the educators, and us on one table. We talk about it. We talk about what's needed from them and that they're in there for a longer period of time that they're signing a contract with us and all those on the table are involved in that and, and, and play a role in that and they're important to make sure that this is going to be a success. And I think the most happy per people that are walking out of the room are almost, almost every time the parents because they <laughs> see that there's something going on that will help their kids develop into something that they can they, they can build their lives on and they can earn a living on even just with high school without them having to finance a, a, an expensive college degree. So that's the third, the third thing and there was several others. Which profession are you training? It's uh, industrial uh, ma maintenance. maintenance. Yes. Okay. Um, but we, we, um, we started with a first year approach, so let's say where mm -hmm. our first year is going, all of, mm -hmm. the, all of the students are going through the same and then we're, we're trying to separate them into, into separate trades, like tool and die makers in a metal uh, forming industry is a very, very important one. It's very hard to get down here in, in Georgia. Um, welding is, is another one, maintenance, mechatronics, the, all those we will split up then after the, second, after the first year of our program. Irene, I think we should all go on a tour. I see this bus, Georgia Cat, on tour mm -hmm. to Georgia. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Lieutenant Governor is going to sponsor that? <laughs> uh, yeah. I can cook German. <laughs> That's a good start. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so, Martin, I think you, I think you would echo the yeah. importance yeah. of getting the parents involved. I think, yeah. you know, I've, I obviously missed to talk about that, but that was always the, the key point. What you just mentioned, we exactly did the same. Uh, we always brought the parents in already four years ago when we started with the first students because I also have uh, children. I want to know where they are, and I want to know who are their bosses, what is their environment they will be working in. And this is very important because it's like a, it's like a marriage. There's good days and there's bad days. And uh, Kids will come home and cuss and 
whatever about work, and then you have to have the support from the parents that they say, look it, that's how work life is. It's tough sometimes. And uh, they will come home, you know, and will be everything will be great. So I think that's important. That's what we did years ago, and that's what we did in this program too. Um, when we did the interviews, we brought them in with their parents intentionally. We gave the parents a company tour while the student was interviewed. So they were not sitting in the same room at the interview, but parents were always there. So, But you're right, we have the same feelings. The parents were really grateful. They're like, this is the right program for my kid. Thank you for offering that. That's, you know, I just wish I could be in his or her shoes and you know, I could have an offer like that when I was young. So, Angie, I remember one of our young people in this first class, uh, this first cohort, who both their par both parents were university graduates. Uh, it was a shift for them, but they saw the passion that their young person had and uh, became very supportive of the idea. Martin, and, uh, and if I can chime yeah, in, yeah, on, on, yeah. you know, we're calling this the German apprenticeship system because mm -hmm. we started with the German apprenticeship standards. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the the real key here, in, in, and it goes back to the parents uh, or the high schoolers, is we're starting at the high school level, mm -hmm. and and that is so so important because if we allow these kids to graduate and go away without enticing them into uh, going into the, uh, the skilled trades, we lose them for 10 years. And the average student that, that darkens the door of a technical college is 25, 26, 27 years old. And we've lost 10 years of, of really good productivity and, and, and some ideal years that, that they're trying to figure out what they want to do when they, when they grow up. Uh, and many of them go to college and rack up a lot of student debt, and and uh, so so that's I think that's the key, is is dipping down into the high schools, and thankfully Georgia has has the landscape of education system has changed over the last two or three years that will allow the the different educational systems to work together better uh, to allow that to happen. So, Kenny, I think that's the average age across the country in community and technical colleges. It's about 27 years old. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're no different than any other state. Exactly. Exactly. Other questions? Yes. Yes. One, one other question uh, to you from Greg Um Are you having uh, your own dedicated trainers in-house, and, and do you um, have them full-time working on training programs, or is that a mentorship approach that you're taking? No. Um, the idea was to hire somebody, a master from Germany. We had a hard time to convince them to come over. So we will do this with uh, um, a younger person from our shop that is very experienced, more than 15 years tenure, but he's still in his 40s. So he can work with younger students, and uh, at the beginning it will be more mentorship. But uh, all these companies agreed they will have to train the trainer program for all of the trainers through technical college system. And uh, again, the curriculum will come from Germany. So the ADA uh, paperwork that you would need to train an apprentice, you will have to go through that training and that certification. Uh, and we'll have that with this person. Yeah, that all exists in English. I just ordered it last week. So and yes, it will be a so. dedicated person um, that in the and we just started that, so in the first year, not too much, but over the years, at the end, it will be a full-time position, yes. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. What, let's, let's get microphones. Yeah. yeah. We work with Larry Alford a good bit on several different programs, and we all know that any program doesn't happen overnight. Um, could you speak to just a little idea of the timeline from the conceptual involvement to how long it took to actually put this program on the ground? So I would strongly recommend that you have a good relationship with your college and career academy and have some experience with work-based learning as a company. Um, I would say that's a prerequisite. And then uh, from the start of uh, bringing all that together to the first inaugural signing was a little bit more than a year. That's encouraging. Katie? 
Um, this may go to you. <laughs> um, you mentioned the, how important it is to educate the parents and have a mind shift, and we run into that just with college and career academies in general. Um, what about you've got a whole bunch of high school teachers and counselors who all have a, probably a master's degree, mm -hmm. and so then now they're going to tell students that's not the same pathway for you. And so what things did you do to get this first group of yours to get teachers in your schools to support um, their high-achieving students doing this? Sure. We had the companies develop a profile of the kind of student they were looking for. Uh, in most cases, the company would say we're looking for that, uh, that, that B-minus student. We're not looking for the A student. We're not looking for the D student. We're looking for that B-minus student. So the companies provided a profile. We took that to our high school principals, our guidance counselors. They worked to get recommendations from teachers. We had 120 students recommended. We took the companies to each of our three high schools and we did programs. And they were uh, an hour, two hour programs where the companies talked about who they are, what they do, um, to get the high school students engaged. We gave them information to share with their parents. 31 of them chose to take the compass test to say we're really interested in this. 20 scored program ready. We then spent time at the companies bringing in the parents and the students so those parents and students could get deeper into what the companies do and what the program is about. We spent um, a good two months doing that. It was very intensive. We wish we could have had longer, but we had to get all the, all the approvals done before we could start that recruiting. We'll start that recruiting this year about October. But we, we did this in about a two-month period before those students began to be interviewed and then selected by the companies. And Mark, let me add something. Yeah, uh, we had something else more or less three years in the making and we'll continue doing that. And that is um, on a National Manufacturing Day and uh, in short, we have a Manufacturing Appreciation Week. Within these uh, days and weeks, uh, we invited uh, counselors, teachers to visit. We more or less had an open day at a, at a company, let them tour a company to understand how modern manufacturing looks like. And then the uh, Coweta Development Authority and the West uh, um, Georgia Technical College organized a discussion where we could, you know, discuss with the teachers and counselors what is the need in industry and, uh, you know, what they can understand from that tour that just got. Katie, after we started that three years ago, then in the last two years, we've had a program called Coweta Industrial Fellowship for Teachers. Dr. Donald White is here, and he's worked with the Development Authority, uh, with the City's Development Authority, with uh, Georgia Tech, with West Georgia Tech, with the school system, with CEC. And what we've created is something that kind of mimics what happens at Georgia Tech in the Georgia Industrial Fellowship for Teachers. We have an externship program during the summer where teachers from elementary, middle, and high school are paid, not by the school system, but by those investors in the program. They're paid to go spend a week in those manufacturing companies to learn about it, and Dr. White to take those uh, learnings back into the classroom and begin to apply that in their lessons so that young people get that hands-on uh, experience, knowledge, and a sense of what the opportunities are in 21st century manufacturing. Dr. White, I think you've told me that our science standards nationwide are moving toward an engineering bias and away from some of the bias of the past. Is that, that accurate? Uh, that is accurate, Mark. Um, we're moving away from the um, focus on facts, figures, formulas, uh, and moving more towards uh, the phenomenon, the engineering approach to problem solving. Um, we are definitely uh, we're definitely uh, trying to model more of what we're seeing in um, the workplace, in the classroom. 
Uh, and that workplace looks very different um, than it did uh, when I got my uh, education education. Um, so we're trying to, to, to reach out to the communities, to reach out to our employers in those communities and make the connection with the classroom. The, the SIFT program you know, uh, is, is a great example of that. And you hear so many uh, aha moments from that, that program where teachers are saying that there are students in their classroom who are not academic. Um, and that as a teacher, they can't see a place in the world for those students. But then they go to some place like Yamaha, Grenzebach, uh, EGO, those kind of places, and they see the kind of skills and the kind of, uh, uh, of things that the, the students actually need that they're not teaching them. Um, they're not in the, the curriculum. They're not in the math curriculum. They're not in the, the English curriculum. That, that is the intent of the new science standards specifically, that we're trying to drive that home, that there are skills that are required. It's not facts, figures, formulas, it's skills. And so uh, I represent the Georgia Science Teachers Association uh, and work closely with the DOE and, and those kind of groups trying to craft that message. And that is one of the things that we really want to emphasize is that the new science standards emphasize skills and that they tie in directly with the kind of things that we're trying to do with GCAT, where we're trying to make it real, trying to give it context. So I think this kind of program is crucial. I see so many opportunities for us to cross over. Um, and in doing so, the teachers become your advocates for this program. Because so many times the teachers just don't have the experience to understand what, what it's like outside the classroom. My only uh, um, experience outside of the classroom is with Chick-fil-A. Um, and um, that, while that was quite an experience, uh, it, it is, I'm not, I was not equipped to tell my high school chemistry students what they needed to know and be able to do in order to, to be successful in the workplace. You went through Georgia Tech's program, did you not? I did. Yeah, yeah. Three years, uh, three summers yeah. um, with Georgia Tech. Yeah. So, Katie, that's a long answer to a short question, but we've got a community here that's been building on that kind of effort for the last 20 years. And you've got Dr. White doesn't work here with career and technical education. Dr. Redekop does. Dr. White is the science content specialist for the school district and the STEM coordinator. But that's the kind of interchange that goes on here and the kind of collaboration that happens. And that is critical. It, we found it critical to getting parents and teachers on side with this kind of idea. Mark, I have one last question, but before I ask my question, I want to say we've decided that you need to host a weekly TV show on education issues and broadcast <laughs> it across the country here. So. Uh, but what I'm really surprised Kenny touched on this in the fact that, you know, this is a a unique model based on some German standards and German credentialing, but in principle, it's the same as the youth apprenticeship program we've been doing for a long, long time. I'm really shocked that today, the major number one obstacle we have in apprenticeship state, statewide has not even come up the first time. And that is the reluctance of employers, especially in these kinds of areas, to involve kids under the age of 18. As a matter of fact, we're sitting here talking about involving kids as early as 15 and the laws and obstacles in the way of that. It's, it's really blowing my mind that this is happening. Um, why is it that you got eight significant major companies in this partnership and that's not an issue with any of those, yet we go everywhere else and the first thing we hear is, oh, we can't want any kids in our, through our doors unless they're 18. Oh, rest assured, you heard this from every other company here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, and it's not possible, right. lawyers will say no. Yep. But it's your own lawyers. It's not OSHA. It's not DOL. It's not the child labor laws. It's not. It's in your own mindset, whatever your own rules that you made up. That's what's limiting you. It's, it's why we've created a system in America uh, it's not a Georgia problem, it's an American problem. We've created a system in America that doesn't really welcome programs like this. We've created 
that mindset, and it's not in the law. I know, and I know, Andrew, we talked about this when we met with Mike Royal and Dr. Wall about the Manufacturers Association helping us address this statewide, but it's something we're going to need some help with as an educational community if we're going to expand and do more and more of this. We've got to solve that problem. There's a lot of ignorance about it because it's not true. And there are more things kids can do than things they can't do. And I think this is an example of where they've shown how far you can go. And we still have some obstacles, mm -hmm. but we're trying to work on those. Um, and it will probably be longer term. But I think what they have shown is if you, if you have a vision and you go after it, you can get 90% there. And it's really a matter of having an attitude of we're going to do this, not we're not going to do this. Um, and it's just not true that kids under, that have to be 18 to get into a manufacturing environment. It's One of the big true. helps that we got in this was from Georgia Tech's uh, Innovation uh, Institute, the, the a manufacturing extension partnership. There is a young worker safety program there. You know Jenny Holrood. And Jenny worked with all these companies to, to help show them what they can do. She is our, in essence, our OSHA liaison for Georgia. And she worked with these companies to show them what they can do and in some cases what they can't do. And Very I can nice. tell you that we're, we are making headway as evidenced by the number of people in, in this room that is interested in, in how this, this initiative was put together. And it is starting to be replicated in other areas of the state. We, you know, we've got groups in, in Dalton and Valdosta and Athens all looking to put consortiums of companies together and partner with their local college and career academy and, and technical college partners to replicate just exactly what happened here. Other questions? All right, hearing none. Guys, thank you all for your attendance. Panelists, thank you. Could you all help me thank these panelists? <laughs>